Well, good morning and welcome to Compass North Richland Hills. My name is Luke Davidson. I'm the campus pastor here. I'm so glad that you all are with us. I want to welcome everybody joining us online as well. Would you guys make some noise for everybody online so that they can hear you? We love you guys so much. And uh, I know that the snow kept you guys home. I'm just joking. There's no snow yet. Maybe there'll be some. My kids have been so excited. I don't know if your kids or you're excited or you're just miserable like the thought of snow. Some of you moved down here from places with lots of snow so you wouldn't have snow anymore. So this is like the most ironic thing when it does come. And I have been here a couple times when like the snow and the ice shut down the whole city. Because Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, they don't know what to do when snow comes. <laughs> everything just shuts down. So I'm hoping that everything will be just fine. And uh, all of you braving us and, and braving the, uh, the elements here with us today, just thank you all for being here with us. Listen, I had a great New Year. Did you all have a great New Year? I got to go spend some time with my family in Kentucky. And uh, I just had the most random story that has nothing to do with my sermon today. But I just thought I'd share it with you. So my, uh, my family, my, my parents, my wife's parents, uh, all live in Louisville, Kentucky. That's where we all grew up. And my brother's family also lives in Louisville, Kentucky. And my brother, if you don't know my story, my brother was in a car accident in 2012, and he died from the complications of that accident. Three kids and his wife. And so when we get to go back there, we usually go in the winter and in the summer. It's just a great time for us to try to connect with our family and to try to make up for some lost time and to try to invest because it's a painful situation. So our bond is really close. And so whenever my nephews and my niece, whenever they want to do something, I just, you know, we got to figure out how to do it. Let's go play basketball. Absolutely. Let's figure it out while I'm in town. Let's do whatever it is. So one day we were at my parents' house and my nephew comes and finds me. And if you don't know, my parents have like a little 20 acre horse farm and there's lots of deer and stuff that come across from time to time. So my nephew who is graduated from high school and, and he is now looking at what's next for him, which has been complicated by COVID is, you know, it has been for so many people, but he comes up to me and says, uncle Luke, I got something that you can't say no to. <laughs> and if you saw my Instagram, you know what we did. He said, I just found a deer skull, and I want to boil it so I can put it on my wall. And I thought, at first, I was like, no way. I'm not. That's crazy. We're not doing that. And then I thought, it's my nephew. So we went and found a trash can and built a bonfire, and we boiled this deer skull over a fire for my nephew and hung it on his wall. What did, what did you do for the holiday? It was the weirdest thing I've ever done, and it was great memories and great, great things. And another really cool thing that happened that day is I got to spend a few minutes with my cousin. My cousin has gone through a lot in his life, and um, he's made a lot of mistakes. A lot of horrible things have happened to him, and maybe you have kind of found yourself there. Or you know somebody that's like that. And he told me the story about how recently, I can give you more details if you want to ask another time, but he told me recently he's been reading some things, and as he's been reading and as he's been praying these specific prayers, the voices that he had been hearing, that's right, he had been hearing voices, he'd been tormented by a lot of different things, he said they have stopped, and it has given him more pronounced understanding of God's power in his life, and so he's leaned into that more, and he's drawing closer to God. Guys, that just really gave me hope for his whole situation. We've been praying for him for years. So I just wanted to encourage you with that story. Don't give up whatever you're going through. Or if you have a family member, you don't know God's timing and God's plan. And I just think we should celebrate just with a story like that. Can you guys just celebrate that God is good and that he's moving and he's working among us? I'm really excited for this year. Guys, this year, 2021, is going to be incredible for our church. There is some stuff coming that has been long in the works Specifically, you guys are aware, if you're not, we have property. We're going to start building later this year. It's really exciting to think about. So I want you to come and be a part of our vision nights. We've got two vision nights. You could choose one of them. The one I'm going to recommend is January 22nd. January 22nd. Mark your calendars. Even if you've been to a previous event, you say, oh, Luke already told me about this. No, I need you to be uh, at our vision night January 22nd or t January 15th, if that works better for you. But the one on January 22nd is going to be right here in this room. 
and we're going to share and cast the vision for our church for the next two years, not just this year. There's even more exciting stuff coming on into the future after that. So make sure you're there. In fact, I would love if you have your phone and you want to go ahead and register right now, that really helps us out and figure out child care and all the different seating and all that. If you would go ahead and register, you can go to compass.church forward slash vision night. That'll be January 15th or 22nd. The 22nd will be right here in this room from 6.30 to 8.30. You really don't want to mess it. I would love for you to be there. But as we talk about this new year, I just want to start. In a couple weeks, we're going to talk about the church's vision and everything. But I think it would be so great for you and I to kind of get a new, a fresh look at the purpose of the church. And, and that's the purpose of you because you are the church. Now, if you don't consider yourself a Christian or you're not sure how you're involved, that's fine. I get that. But those of you that consider yourselves a follower of Jesus, you are the church. And so what does 2021 look like for us? What does it look like for you personally? And where we would like to start out as a church is to think about this year being not about you. Or, or you could say what I'm trying to say, this year is not about me. Can you all just say that? This year is not about me. Ready on three. One, two, three. This year is not about me. We're going to talk about something brand new that Jesus did that is still fresh. It is ever fresh. It is always new. It is always powerful because it's continuing to renew the constructs of this world and society and culture. It's this brand new thing that Jesus did where he took religion and faith and life and society and everything that had been about me focused. And he said, no, it's not about me. It's, it's about others. It's about loving one another. It was this brand new thing. And so we're continuing today in this series called Brand New. And if you missed last week, it's going to be helpful just to kind of give you an introduction. Uh, but we started last week, and I just want to kind of do a quick recap. We talked about this brand new thing that Jesus did. And to kind of help us understand what made it unique, what made it distinct, we talked about what what the old thing was. And just for the sake of this, to help us understand it, we're just calling it the temple model. And the temple model, if you remember last week or if you weren't here, let me catch you up. The temple model is marked by a lot of different things, but maybe four things specifically. The temple model has sacred places. These are places that are set aside for some special sacred purpose. And then you've got sacred texts. There's always a sacred text, whether it's an inscription or a writing or even an oracle. By the way, we're not just talking about Christianity here. We're talking about across the world. The temple model does exist everywhere, even to this day, especially when you go to third world countries, you will see this. You could go to Haiti. I've been to Haiti, and you'll be driving across the middle of nowhere, and there's little temples everywhere. So we're not talking about big billion dollar temples. They can be very small, a sacred space that is set apart. There's sacred text or oracles there. And then, of course, sacred men who have the authority to connect with, the, with what, is, what their God wants of the people and wants of them. And then you have the sincere followers who do what they say. They listen to the sacred men because the sacred men are connected to the sacred texts and they are in the sacred place. They have possession of it. But Jesus came along and brought an entirely different way to approach our religious experience. So now there's not just like a sacred place you can go because he makes everywhere a sacred place. Everyone becomes sacred in Christ. It's crazy. In fact, his apostles used language to say there's no longer a sacred place that you go to and call the temple. You are the temple. And when you interact with other people, you are interacting with God's temple. That's how strong the language was of the early Christians. 1 Corinthians 6.19. If you haven't heard this before, what a great, what a great powerful concept. He says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. 
the early Christians and you and I in Christ, when you begin to follow Christ, he makes you right with God. He makes you holy. And so now the Holy Spirit of God comes and dwells in you. And you become the temple of God. And we together are being built into God's temple. In fact, many times they will talk about us that are in Christ as if we are the building blocks of the temple and, and that Jesus himself is the cornerstone. So now we don't go to a sacred place with a sacred text and sacred men and sincere followers because you are made sacred in Christ. And now everybody in Christ, doesn't matter if you're black or white or rich or poor or men or women or children, in Christ, you and they and each other are God's temple. Now, if that sounds a little crazy to you, maybe you've never thought of it that way. Maybe it's because religion really has its grips in a lot of us in a, in a, in a way that's maybe more focused on the, like a temple model. And, and what we know is that religion is very powerful. In fact, it's, it's dangerous. It can be very dangerous. When it gets in the hands of the wrong people, they can drive religion with superstition and fear, and it can really drive people's behavior in a way that is anchored in your conscience. Like it affects how you treat other people at a fundamental level of who you are because of how that is controlled. And so it is something that if you have been in an environment that a religious experience got in the hands of the wrong people, it was very destructive for you, probably. It might have been something that destroyed a part of you, that maybe caused you to lose a little faith in this thing that Jesus had done. You said, man, I really believed in it, but if this is what it looks like, I want nothing to do with it. And I just want to talk a little bit about what we're talking about this year or this idea of trying to refocus ourselves. I know a lot of people, whenever it comes to like New Year's resolutions and stuff, they just kind of, oh, you know, it's so dumb. In a week, you'll be back eating everything and all that stuff. I'm, I'm the opposite. I love any opportunity to say, hey, how could we hit the restart button? How could I hit refresh? How could I recalibrate myself? And if we're going to recalibrate ourselves to start out this year and to think about the things that kind of get entangled within us and our identity and the way that we think and function and treat other people, that there are some things that need to be stripped away. And so today I want to talk about some of the things that need to be stripped away. And uh, next week, I'm going to talk about how the thing that Jesus did, the brand new thing that he did, how it inspired such worldwide change in a way that is undeniable. But there are some things that even to this day, we have to be intentional to strip away. Because if you grew up in the West, if you grew up in America, you were shaped by Christianity and by a value system that is Christian, whether you think you're a Christian or not, because it's just a part of it. But if you grew up in America and in the West, you were shaped by a version of Christianity that is influenced by Jesus, which is good, but it's also influenced by what we might call, for the sake of this series, the temple model. And that's not good. And it will affect how you think you're supposed to follow Jesus in a way that maybe is not accurate at all. And so we have to kind of strip those things away. Whoever controls your conscience ultimately controls your behavior. So let's try to strip some things away today because I know so many people have left churches or have been wounded by churches because they got into a situation where the wrong people were in control and your attendance at church wasn't right and so you were disciplined in ways that didn't feel Christ-like, and there were things that began to be a part of your understanding of who God is that would, instead of being dominated by love and self-sacrifice, you were just dominated by fear and superstition and pain. And it can be very, very destructive. And a lot of people have abandoned church. Some people will not even give church the time of day. You could tell them all day long, hey, you, you wouldn't believe what my church does in the community, you wouldn't believe how they take care of each other, but they can't see it because the marketing and the brand 
looks to many people like this temple model, and that's not what Jesus came to establish. Which is why this past Wednesday, and let's talk about that ever so briefly, but let's go there for just a moment. This past Wednesday, when there was a lot of people in our capital, I had a family member, a friend, who was there to pray, to, to try to show support and love. But an insurrection overtook the capital. And there are things that people see when they watch that if you're not even a follower of Christ and you see a picture, you see a picture like this one, where somebody held up a poster that says Jesus saves in front of the Capitol, the epicenter of what this week is the most controversial thing in our nation. And when you see something like this, and you understand, you know, because as a follower of Christ, or if you're not a follower of Christ, you, I don't even have to tell this to you, but as a follower of Christ, you have probably had conversations where you tried to defend your faith. You say, hey, we love, we care, we take care of people. Let's throw that picture back up there one more time. And then, I, and then something like that happens at the epicenter of our nation and people see something like this and they see a poster that says Jesus saves and in their mind they don't have experience with Jesus they're not experiencing the Holy Spirit in their life as a temple and in their minds they say something along the lines of maybe you've heard this before that is why I will never be a Christian because that's what they all think and that's what they all do and that's not true Every Christ follower that I have talked to, their hearts, my heart, our hearts were broken in two on Wednesday. And I know that yours were too. So we want Jesus to come and we want to continue this brand new thing. If we can move that picture off now. It's a lot. There's a lot of pain and a lot of things in our hearts and our minds. But I think it's just another poignant example that we have an important process in front of us. To say we have a brand of Jesus that right now has gotten so mixed up in so many people's minds that they won't even consider the grace of God through Jesus Christ. They say, I want nothing to do with it. But the good news is for anybody that finds themselves in that category and anybody that's listening and we continue to try to reach out, right? I've got, I've got good news for you. Jesus came to do something that was brand new, something that brought a different flavor to life and that has shaped so many incredible and good and beautiful things that sometimes you might have to dig beneath the surface. But we have an opportunity, not, not just a responsibility, we have an opportunity we have an opportunity to help people see that brand new thing. But we have to see it in ourselves first. And there might be some things that need to be removed. Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. The Apostle Paul said something powerful. I cannot tell you how altering this was for him as a Jew. As a Jewish person who then began to follow Jesus, everything about his categories, about how he related to God, changed. The things that he says in these next two paragraphs are ridiculously different than what he grew up in and the mode of religion and the temple model that he had been a part of. He says this, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. He says if you go back into those things or if you let those things get their claws back in you, you will, you will become a slave a slave to those things. Mark my words, Paul says. I tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, which is, was this procedure and mark of being Jewish. He says, if you let this happen to you for the sake of being Jewish and trying to get uh, credit in the temple model system, that's what they were doing. Here's the ritual. Here's what you have to do in order to be a follower of God, in order to be right with God. He says, if you do that, Christ is of no value to you. And maybe you can think about rituals and things that you do today to say, oh, I have to do this in order to get right with God. I have to do this in order to be forgiven and things like that. He says, if you want to play that game, the things, you know, I have to make this sacrifice, this offering, this sort of prayer, I have to say this, and I have to, you know, spend three times or whatever it is. And I know we kind of laugh at that stuff, but so many people have certain amount of things that, hey, I have to do this and this and this. He says, if that's how you're going to live, if that's the game you're going to play, then Christ is of no value to you. 
Again, I declare that every man who lets himself be circumcised, that he is obligated to obey the whole law. And I know if this sounds weird to you, he's just saying in their Jewish system, in order to be a good Jew at that time, this is something that you had to do as a ritual in order to be a part of God's people. And he's saying this, this thing that Jesus has done is brand new and it's different than that. He says, you are trying to be justified by the law, the Old Testament covenant, and have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. And you could insert something there that you do. Say the different things that you do to try to make yourself right with God have no value. Because the only thing that makes you right with God is what Jesus did for you. I know that sounds crazy for you. You think, well, if I do this, this, and this, that makes God happy. No, the thing that makes God happy is Jesus' sacrifice for you and you trusting in him and receiving his righteousness. The rightness of Jesus becomes your rightness. And so here's what, here's what Paul and all the other disciples say and teach. Look at this right here. This is just crazy. It says, the only thing that counts. Can we go back to the previous slide for just a second? The only thing that counts. I wonder if you were to fill in the blank and say the only thing that counts in Christianity is. If you were to fill in the blank and say the only thing that matters is for Jesus. The only thing that counts. The only thing. And you could say, what do Christians really like? What would be the fundamental thing? And here's what Paul, here's how he answers the question. I don't know if I were just to sit down having not seen this, if I would have gotten the right answer. I, I doubt that you would have too, because there's a lot of things. Oh yeah, we got to do this. And as a Christian, this is really important. That's fundamental. That's really important. But look what Paul says. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Specifically, love to only to, to other people. It's not about me. It's about loving my neighbor. It's about loving the person next to me. It's about treating the person at work well and caring for them well. And this is something that Paul said again and again and again. This is the, Jesus said again, we could go all throughout the New Testament. I'm going to show you some others here in a little bit. And the weird thing is, the world began to take notice of the Christians living this way, that the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The, the early Christians lived this way, and the world took notice. Like things, like the early Christians took in children off the streets who had been abandoned. And Christians still do this to this day. It's crazy. The adoption and the, and the care and the, the foster programs that so many Christians are involved in. This was totally revolutionary at that time because in pagan temple model understanding like if you had been born with a deformity or a special need that that meant that God had cursed you he didn't love you and so they would just abandon they still do this in India with girls oh you're not a boy uh, you're a girl we just we don't want a girl they'll just abandon you and we have a we have a children's home in India that I've been to that's taken in over 100 and I think close to 50, 150 kids that have just been abandoned in a village out in the middle of nowhere. And people can't understand, why do Christians do this? Well, because the only thing that matters is a value. Christ has made us righteous. We're right with God. And so now our, our job is to get right with each other. And so the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love. So there's these kids out here who are not loved, so we're going to go love them and, and bring them in. This had never been done before in the temple model system, before Jesus. I mean, people, you abandon kids. Nobody cares about them. They're a nuisance. It's another mouth to feed, and it's going to make the gods angry with you anyway, and you don't want anybody that's impure or wrong, so we'll just abandon them. The Christians brought them in. The Christians took care of the poor, not just the, their own poor. They took care of pagan poor. They took care of Greek poor, and they took them in and, and fed them. And I guarantee you that there were reasons for some of them as to why they were poor. And nobody said, well, they're poor but for this reason, so they don't, they don't deserve to get fed. No, they just fed them, and they just took care of them. It was crazy. The world never seen before. But the thing that really caught the world's attention was that the Christians were not afraid of death because they, they worshipped a resurrected Savior who had been killed, and God brought him back to life. They said, you try to kill him. God brought him back to life, so we're not scared of death because our God's going to bring us through it, and we will experience resurrection in the future as well. It's crazy. And this, this Christian movement, this brand new thing that Jesus did, just changed everything. 
And, and if you think there was an association with the temple, like they, their temple was completely destroyed in the year 70 AD. Like it did not even exist, wiped off the face of the, the, the surface of the earth, just gone. So it was not a place that they went to anymore. And what it meant to be a Christian took on this brand new form in a way that had never been seen before. But then a major shift happened. And honestly, there's a lot of things that contributed to it. But one of the major things that historians will point, point to is the year 312 AD, October 28th, Emperor Constantine was going to battle against the co-emperor, Maxentius, to decide who would be the supreme ruler of the Roman Empire. And on his way into battle, as historians tell us, Constantine saw a vision in the sky. And if you've heard this before, it looked something like this, Chi Rho. This is an X and what looks like a P to us, or the, the Greek letter Rho. Uh, those are the first two letters of the word Christ in Greek, which would be C, H, and R for us. But for them, it's like an X and this P shape. He saw this in the sky, the symbol of Christ in his brain. And he either heard or saw the inscription that said, in this sign, conquer. So he immediately got some of his soldiers. They painted this symbol on their shields, marched into battle, and they were victorious. And he gave credit to the God of the Christians. And so Constantine, the emperor of Rome, the empire that killed Jesus and had slaughtered Christians for 300 years, became a Christian, which sounds great because he poured all sorts of money into the church and that elevated the status of the bishops and the priests. And a year later, he made Christianity legal. That's right, it was illegal before then. So anytime that you're worried about Christianity being illegal and that it wouldn't thrive, actually probably its most fruitful years were the first 300 years of Christianity when it was completely illegal. He made it legal. That's great, right? So now they're building churches all over the place. They're huge. People are pouring money in because it's tax-free, right? And I can get a tax donation. And it became everybody's benefit to become a Christian because the emperor is a Christian. He's not going to work with me if I'm not a Christian. So now there's perks to being a Christian, which sounds great, except at a certain point, this empire became inseparable from Christianity. I couldn't tell the difference between the two. And other things happened, and it's just a lot to get through in a single day. One of the things that was probably most destructive in the history of the church is the Crusades, where so many people were told, if you go and fight to get back to the Holy Land, all your sins will be forgiven simply by fighting. Christians were some of the first adopters of the idea of holy war. I don't know if you knew that, but the Crusades were a part of that. You can go do whatever you want. As long as you fight in the Crusades, all your sins are forgiven. Well, there were a lot of landowners and knights who had a lot of sins that needed to be forgiven. And so they raped and pillaged their way all across Europe in the name of being forgiven. They didn't care about loving their neighbor. They said, well, I'm going to be forgiven, so I'm going to go kill and rape and pillage all the way through. And they said, well, now we've taken over the Holy Land and the people who occupied the space where Jesus lived. Why not kill the people that killed Jesus? And so then they began killing Jews men and women and children all across Europe. Guys, this got really bad. So bad that members within this Christian movement said, we got to reform this. Martin Luther was a priest who said, a man, a simple layman armed with scripture is greater than the mightiest pope without it. And he declared, we got to reform this. But then over time, the reformers as well became a part of a lot of things that divided and the Reformation split into three and then six and then 12. And now here we are today. We've got a thousand different denominations all throughout the world and everybody's pointing at each other. And what have we gotten? A lot of people who feel like our entire religious experience is about going to a certain place, focusing on a certain sacred text, listening to the sacred men who tell me what I can and cannot do so that I can be a sincere follower. And the whole concept the fundamental teaching of Christ and his disciples that the only thing of value, the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love, that's lost in the shuffle. And so many people think, well, what do I have to do? Love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, 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 but, but what's, the, what's the stuff? I, I got to read my Bible, right? And I have to do this and that. And it's no, if you love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus was very clear about the motive behind this. John chapter 13 
Look at this. A new command I give you. Here's the command. Love one another. As I have loved you, which is the most sacrificial love that's ever been displayed by humans. It says, I, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Think about, how will they know we are Christians? How will they know that we're followers of Jesus? So you fill in the blank. And he says, no, the thing that will mark you as a follower of Jesus is your love for one another. Paul, in another place in his letter, Galatians 5.14 says, the entire law is fulfilled in keeping one command. Everything is fulfilled in one command. Can you all just say it? Love your neighbor as yourself. Let's try that again. The entire law, your entire purpose is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Everybody say it together. Ready? Love your neighbor as yourself. Peter, one of Jesus' closest followers, said, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, you've been purified by Christ and obeying him and becoming a follower of Christ. If you haven't done that, that's okay. We can talk more about that. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you're purified. You're made right with God. So what is your job? He says, So you have sincere love for each other. Therefore, love one another deeply from the heart. And that's the thing that I just want us to reckon with a little bit today. It's like the one thing that Jesus wants us to do is to love one another deeply from the heart. And I feel like we are in the midst of a, of a nation and a world and a people that we don't love each other. <laughs> and it's certainly not from the heart. And if we have to love each other, it's like, I love you. And I think we have to kind of do some searching inside of us to say, I love you from the heart. From the heart. So just to kind of give us a little maybe exposure and to strip away some of this inside of us, I want you to think about how the temple model creeps into your religious experience and creeps into how you follow Jesus, okay? And it is very sinister. It's very sinister. And it seems very subtle. It is subtle, but it is drastic. So let me talk about a few things. Sin proximity. Sin proximity. Have you ever wondered how close you can get to sin without actually sinning? You say, God... I don't really want to, like, forsake this world and all the sinfulness of it. I just want to get as close to sinning. I want to have as good of a time as I can without actually sinning. Like, where's the line? And people will come up and they'll ask preachers and pastors all the time, hey, how close to sinning can I get without actually sinning? Teenagers say, wow, they ask this question all the time. Hey, how far can I go without actually sinning? And, and it's like, wow, what a bad question. Because you're more concerned about yourself than you are concerned about the person that you might hurt or that you might affect or might be in counseling for the rest of their lives. What about guilt? Has there ever been a time in your life, maybe you're in it right now, I certainly have felt this, where you felt more guilty about messing church or messing Bible study or messing some religious temple experience, you felt more guilty about messing church than you felt guilty about how you treated that person at work. I know that I've done that. And that's where we are more focused on the religious temple experience than we are on the loving your neighbor as yourself. What about moral sin? Have you ever for failed morally? Maybe you had an affair, multiple affairs. Maybe it was before you were married or after you were married or somewhere along the way. At that time, whenever you failed morally, whatever that looked like for you, you, you define it. I don't care. I'm not here to tell you a biblical story on morality today. I just want you to think about a time that, that you did something in that moment. Were you, were you more concerned about what God would do to you because of what you did than what you just did to that person you sinned with? Because if you are, then that's the temple model experience where you're more concerned. Hey, how can I get right with God? What do I need to do to make up for myself and not remembering that Jesus already made you right with God, and now your job is simply to get right with other people. And so you're more concerned, how can I get right with God? Instead of concerned about, what did I just do to that person? How can I get right with them? And that you're just, it's a, it seems subtle, but it's a drastic difference. What about rituals? And I talked about this earlier. Do you think there's a prayer or some ritual that, that removes your responsibility to make restitution with somebody else? If I do this, if I say this, if I spin around three times, if I, if I serve in this way enough, then I don't have to actually go ask for forgiveness. I don't have to actually go talk to that person. If you are a manager or a boss or you oversee people at work, how often do you spend your days asking people that tell you, hey, they did this to me, they did this, they need to be fired, and you're just saying, have you talked to them yet? Well, I'm not doing anything until you talk to them. You have to talk to them. 
And yet we don't apply this to our lives. We talk about our family members. We talk about our neighbors. Oh, they did this. They did this. Have you talked? Have you talked to them? No, but I'll just do these things, and then that'll make me right with God, and it'll remove my responsibility to make restitution with that other person. That's not, that's not what God told us. Self-righteousness. Do other people and their failings, does that make you feel better about yourself, or does it break your heart? Do you feel superior whenever you think about other people who fail? Jesus was pointing out a tax collector. He said this Pharisee, in the temple, was thinking about this tax collector and felt very superior. Look at me. I'm so righteous. Look at all the things I've done. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you I'm not like other people and robbers and evildoers and adulterers, even like that tax collector. For I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all that I get. And Jesus then condemns him for being self-righteous and exalting himself. He says, those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Guys, that's temple model thinking, where we're more concerned about me and my relationship with God than I'm concerned about others. So the question that we're going to begin to break down next week is, what does love require of me? Because the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love. And the entire law is fulfilled in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. And I want you to start to imagine how it would repair families, how it would repair communities, how it would repair you if you could free yourself and if you could begin to really focus in on the gospel that Jesus came to die for your sins, to make you right with God. You're right with God if you're in Christ. And now our job is to focus on how do I repair my relationships with others? How do I get right with others? How do I love my neighbor as my Self. What does love require from me? And that's what we're going to break down next week. But we've got to be intentional. I want you to think about it this week when it starts to creep in. Just be active to strip that sort of thinking away. And to instead of being fearful for yourself, instead of being concerned, how is this going to affect me? Instead, think, how is this affecting them? person next to you, the person who lives next to you, the person who works with you. How can I love them? We're going to pick it up there next week. Can you pray with me? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for sending Jesus to, search, to show us something completely brand new. And I pray and ask, Lord, that you would help us to be a part of something that restores this brand new thing that you have done and that we might be intentional to strip away anything that tries to fight for dominance in our heart and our mind to say that we are not right with you. You have made us right with you, Lord God, through the sacrifice of Jesus. And so now our job is to love our neighbor well, to love you with all of our heart, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Lord, it's something that sounds so simple, but it's so demanding of us. And I pray that today, even this week, there might be some sort of compelling nature in our conscience, in our heart that says, I can't go another day without talking to that person. I can't go another moment without leaving this right now and going to them and making restitution with them, Lord. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen.